Bibles together and let's turn, if we could, to the book of Romans as we continue our study together through the book of Romans. And we are in the sixth chapter this morning, Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And we are going to begin our reading this morning in verse number 1. Romans chapter 6. You will find an outline in your bulletin this morning. You can follow along with our message. You'll find the scripture there as well. Uh, if you're a visitor, you can follow along uh, as we preach through the Word of God together. Romans chapter 6, we'll begin our reading in verse number 1. The Word of God says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2 says, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye shall obey it in the lust thereof, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. For those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked, verse 17, that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Let's pray together, can we, this morning? Father in heaven, I pray you would help us this morning as we look at your word. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would direct us. And I pray, Father in heaven, that the Spirit of God would guide us into all truth. Father, I pray that you would bind Satan and his demons. I pray that your word would fall on good ground, that it would spring up and grow in our hearts. And I pray, Father in heaven, if there may be an individual that is here this morning that does not know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. May they call upon the name of the Lord, and there they will find eternal life. For the Christian, I pray that you would help us to move forward and take steps closer to you. I pray, Father, you would help us to draw nigh to you. And Lord, we know that you will draw nigh to us. May you be glorified, and may the Word of God be glorified in us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to notice the expression that we find in verse number 4 of our text. The Bible says that in the life of a Christian, there is newness of life. Newness of life. When Paul wrote about doctrine and about Christian living, he often would add in those expressions of truth, really, he would give any objections or fight against any objections that people would have toward the truth that he gave. We have established very important truths as we come into chapter 6, fundamental truths, we could say this morning. 
We've learned from the Word of God, not my opinion, not our church's opinion, but from the Word of God, that all of humanity is lost, both Jew and Gentile. All are condemned before God. This is universal condemnation. All men are, are lost without Christ. You know, it would be hard to find a church in this community this morning that would preach against sin. And yet, this is such an important doctrine to, to, to focus on and to remember because the Bible makes it clear in the book of Romans that all sin will be judged by God. It is appointed unto man once to die and after death the judgment. God is infinitely holy, the Bible teaches us. God is a righteous God, and God cannot and God will not look upon sin. And therefore, the gospel reveals to us who we are, that we are lost, but also the gospel reveals to us who God is, that God is a righteous God. The gospel is God's eternal plan. We learn that, that God's plan is to redeem humanity and yet still retain His righteousness and His holiness, that He can be a just God and also the justifier of humanity. Jesus Christ, in chapter 5, we learn that Jesus Christ is God's gift of righteousness to mankind to save humanity from their sin. For God so loved the world that He gave this gift of His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And therefore, for all those who call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved in Jesus Christ. And Paul made it clear that where sin abounded, all of humanity is lost sin and sin, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And so as we move into chapter 6, someone would be quick to respond, well, if we are saved by grace, and the Bible makes it clear that we are, then therefore the critic would say, well, if grace is abounding, then therefore I can just continue to live in my sin. I can continue, the word continue there in the Greek word is the idea to habitually live. Therefore, I can live any way that I want to live if we are saved by the grace of God. And yet Paul, very blunt, makes the statement in verse 2, God forbid, God forbid. You see, grace is not the license to sin. Grace is not the license to do whatever you want. But, but notice this, grace is the ability to do what you ought in the Lord Jesus. I love what D.L. Moody said about grace. He said, what is grace? He said, men talk about grace, but as a rule, they know very little about it. Like a businessman that would go to a bank and to borrow a few hundred dollars for 60 or 90 days, if he is well able to pay, the banker will perhaps lend him the money. If he can get another responsible man to sign the note with him, they give what they call three days grace. After the 60 or 90 days have expired, they will have the borrower pay interest on the money during these three days. If he cannot return the principal and interest at the appointed time, they will sell his goods. They will perhaps turn him out of his house or take the last piece of furniture in his possession. D.L. Moody said this is not grace at all, but fairly illustrates man's idea of grace. Grace not only frees you from the payment of interest, but it frees you from the principal also. The grace of God frees us from the penalty of our sin without any payment on our part. Christ has paid humanity's debt. And all we have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and receive this gift of God. Grace is God's unmerited favor bestowed towards sinful men. The Bible says in verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Verse 2 says, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? I want to give you some thoughts because really this is a, a question of ignorance, not really understanding what happens when someone is truly 
born again by the Spirit of God, or as the Lord Jesus would say in John chapter 3, a salvation that is wrought in God, a salvation that comes from God, and not a, a salvation made up through religion or by other people or the opinion of man, but a salvation that is truly bestowed upon humanity by God. What happens when someone is truly saved. I want to give you that thought in your notes. Number one, notice our position. Our position as a born-again individual. Now, I added a chart there in your notes. I thought this was very interesting. We find in Romans chapter 3 to Romans chapter 5, really the substitution that is found in the Scripture. The Bible says that he died for me. He died for my sins. He paid sin's penalty. We talked about last week justification. That is righteousness imputed. It is put to my account. When I trust Christ as my Savior, God puts to my account his righteousness. My sin is not put to my account, not added to my account, but the righteousness of God. And so I am saved by Christ's death. But as we move into Romans chapter 6 through chapter 8, we see this identification. And the Bible makes it clear where once we see the substitution and justification, we now see identification and sanctification. I am truly born again, therefore I can say, I died with him. He died unto sin. He broke sin's power. Sanctification is righteousness imparted. I am saved by the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus lives again, I will also live again. So what is our position in the Lord Jesus Christ? Now let's listen as the Bible teaches us. We see letter A in your notes that we died with Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not talking about religion this morning. I'm talking about someone who truly comes to Christ for eternal life. Then the Bible says that your position is that when Christ died, you died. You identify yourself with the death of the Lord Jesus. And this is illustrated in the Word of God in Romans 6 through baptism. Look what the Bible says in verse number 3. It says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. Now baptism has two meanings. There's the literal meaning and it means to dip or to immerse. That's why at Kitchener Baptist Church we baptize by immersion because immersion pictures the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Historians agree that the mode of baptism in the early church was immersion. The believer was buried in the water and brought up Uh, again, as a picture of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. Baptism by immersion, which, by the way, is the picture that we find in Romans chapter 6, pictures the believer's identification with Christ's death and his burial and his resurrection. Therefore, baptism, the waters of baptism, saves no man. In fact, baptism is an outward symbol of, of an inward experience. And so, first of all, there's the literal meaning. It's to dip. It's to immerse. That's what baptism means. But also, the figurative meaning is to be identified with. Baptism is to be identified with the Lord Jesus Christ, His death, His burial, His resurrection. It is to be identified with His local church. They were saved. They were baptized. They were added to the local church. Now, the example of identification can be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's turn there this morning. Let's take our Bibles and let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And notice what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 2. Notice what the Word of God says. The second verse, the 10th chapter in 1 Corinthians. The Bible says, and we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. What is the Bible saying? It's saying that the nation of Israel, they were identified with Moses as their leader by following the cloud by day and by crossing the Red Sea. They were identifying themselves 
as God chose Moses to lead us, and as Moses follows God, we will follow the man of God. And so, friend, when you got saved, we find in the Word of God that you were positioned in Jesus Christ. Now, this is important. We'll talk about this in, in just a moment. But I want you to understand where you are as a born-again born believer. When you got saved, you were positioned in in Jesus Christ. In fact, in verse 3, it says here that you were baptized into Jesus Christ. It speaks of the baptism of the Spirit. When you got saved, the Holy Spirit moved into your heart and your life. And that identifies you with Jesus Christ. In fact, the Bible says that the Spirit of God coming in your heart is God's down payment for the redemption that he will finish in your life. And, and, and let's go to Romans chapter 8. Let's turn a couple of chapters uh, forward here and notice what the Bible says, Romans chapter 8. This is important. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse number 16. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit of God, the baptism of the Spirit, identifies us with Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. In fact, in verse number 9 of the 8th chapter of the book of Romans, the Bible says, but we are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And if so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you, that's the baptism of the spirit of God, that is separate from the waters of baptism after someone is saved, the moment someone trusts Christ as their Savior, they are positioned in Jesus Christ, and this is solidified by the baptism of the Spirit of God upon their life. God moves in, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And the Bible says, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He does not belong to God. He does not, is not a part of the family of God. We are identified by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, therefore, when Christ died, we are also identified with His death. When Christ died, I died. Therefore, the Apostle Paul put it this way in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The believer has a new relationship, the Bible teaches us. We are dead to sin, and we are alive to Jesus Christ. I'll never forget a, a conversation I was listening to a young preacher preach, and he was driving with an older preacher, a very godly man, and they were the older preacher was, was visiting the younger preacher, and he preached for him for the Sunday, and they were driving to a restaurant, and they were, they were conversing and talking about various things in ministry, and the young preacher said something, and it got really quiet. And the young preacher realized, he said, right away I realized I probably shouldn't have said that. And as we were driving for a couple of moments, it was real silent. The young preacher turned to the older preacher and he said, you know, he says, I have to apologize to you. You know, I didn't mean to offend you. I'm so sorry. I should never have said that. And that, that godly older preacher looked at that young man and he said, let me tell you something, son. If, if you offend me, that's not your fault. That's my fault because you can't offend a dead man. The Bible says that we are dead. We died. We were, we were, in this passage of Scripture, identified with Christ in His death. That's what the Bible says. And when Christ died, I died. We are identified with Him in His death. The Bible makes very clear. You say, well, Pastor, our new position is in Christ. What is our old position? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And you hath He quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. So where one once our old position was we were dead in sin, now we are dead unto sin to live in this newness of life. And so the Bible says that we died when Christ died. Be there, the letter B. We are also resurrected with Jesus Christ. The Bible says, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death, 
that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. So that moment when we were baptized by the Spirit of God and our position changed, the Bible says that our position is we are identified with Jesus. When Jesus died, we died. And when Jesus rose from the grave, we rose from the grave. Our spirit now has life. And, and this is important. The Bible says that now we walk in newness of life. We were identified with Christ's death, and now we are identified with Christ's resurrection. The Bible says that we are to walk in this newness of life. It's important to see what the Bible says. The Bible says that the life in Jesus Christ is a new life. The old life is gone, and there is new life in the Lord. In fact, Paul illustrates it well in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. In other words, our attitude toward God is new. We see things differently as the world who does not know God and does not live for God. We desire to please God. We desire to live our life that would honor God. And so our attitude toward ourself is new. We know that there's nothing in ourself that is good. If you see anything in me that is good, it is because of God. It is God which worketh in me both to will and to do his good pleasure. But also our attitude toward sin is new. We know that sin destroys. We know that the devil desires for us to sin because it separates us or, or it affects our fellowship with God. And so our attitude is different. All things become new. Romans chapter 6, verse 5, For if ye have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be raised with him, the Bible says, also in the likeness of his resurrection. We are raised with him. We have new life in Jesus Christ. And just before the world says, well, the life of a Christian, that's just a horrible life to live. Let me tell you something, friend. The life of a Christian is the wonderful life to live. Jesus said, come on to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, he said, and my burden is light. The scripture says in verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Jesus Christ, the Bible says, we are dead in our sins, but after Christ we are aware of the destruction of sin. We are aware of our position in Jesus, and therefore we are a new creature in Jesus. This is our position. Let me give you number two in your notes. Can we notice the power? The power that we find in a biblical salvation. The power that we find in a salvation that is wrought in God. Verse number 10, look what the scripture says. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. If you're in the habit of marking in your Bible and you like to, to look at scripture and to underline and to highlight, would you underline this expression, he died unto sin once but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. How do we overcome sin? How do we live this victorious life? Well, understand that victory is found in Jesus Christ. You see, A there in your notes, his death is a victorious death. His death is a victorious death. The Bible says in this scripture that Jesus died for sin once. The doctrine of transubstantiation is taught in the Catholic Church, and they would claim that every time communion takes place, that they would, they would take literally the blood of the Lord Jesus and the body of the Lord Jesus. Therefore, in their belief and in their doctrine, they would crucify the Lord Jesus Christ every single time this is ta taken place. And my friend, this is not found in the Word of God. This is not biblical. The Word of God tells us that Jesus died 
once for the sin of the world. The hymn writer got it right when he said, free from the law, O happy condition. Jesus had bled and there is remission. Cursed by the law and bruised by the fall, Christ hath redeemed us once for all. Once for all, O sinner, receive it. Once for all, O doubter, believe it. Cling to the cross, the burdens will fall. Christ hath redeemed us once for all. The Bible says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. The death that he died defeated the very power of sin. Therefore, in the life of the Christian, verse 9 of our text, sin hath no more dominion over him. I like what the Bible says. We're coming up to Resurrection Sunday real soon. Next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. And the Bible says in Revelation 1.18, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Sin hath no more dominion. Therefore, when we stand before God, all of those who come to Jesus Christ, the Scriptures teach us, we are justified. We are no longer in our sin. By His death, we gain eternal life. We gain salvation. But by His life, we gain success. He is our mediator. He is in heaven, seated on the right hand of God the Father. And we can talk to God through Jesus Christ. And Jesus is our strength. And Jesus is our power. Look what the Bible says in verse 10. For in that He died, He died unto sin once. But in that He liveth, He liveth unto God. And my friend, today, if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you are a new creature in Jesus. And you are now living for God. Your purpose in life is to serve God. Sin hath no more dominion over Him. There is victory over sin. There is victory over death. There is victory over the grave. We notice the victory in Jesus Christ. We are dead to sin. And we have victory in the Lord Jesus. I heard an old, old story how the Savior came from glory. How He gave His life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about His groaning on His precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and He bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him. And all my love is due Him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. You see, the death of the Lord Jesus was a victorious death. He won the victory and the power over sin and the power over the grave and the power over death. And he says, he declares in the book of Revelation that I hold in my hands the keys of death and hell and there is victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want us to notice letter B in your notes this morning that his life is a, is a, is a, a life not only of victory, but also we see that it is a life of victor a life of vigor. It is a vigorous life. It's found in verse 11 of our text. Likewise, reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God. Alive unto God. Notice that expression. Alive unto God. You see, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but the life that I now live is alive unto God. We are children. We are God's children. And the Bible says that we have an eternal heritage. The, the Bible says that we have an incorruptible promise. In other words, this promise is never going to fade away. We have the Spirit of God that dwells in us. We have a purpose in our heart to live for God every day. He will never leave us. That's a wonderful promise, amen? God will never leave you. God will never forsake you. He will lead us. He'll love us. He does good to us. He works through us. He rewards us for the work that He do, does through us. He guides and directs us. This is the life that we live. It's a vigorous life. It's a dynamic life. The life I live is now for God. Let me give you the third point, and I'll be done this morning. I want us to notice the proposition that's found in this Scripture. The proposition. 
How many here this morning like to garden? If you like to garden, put up your hand. Anyone? All right, we have some. You know, an important rule in gardening is also a biblical principle. You reap what you sow. What you plant is what you're going to grow. That's common sense, right? If you grow carrots, then you plant those carrot seeds, then your hope is that one day you're going to get carrots. You know, it would be something if you planted an apple seed and got an orange tree. We understand the principle in the Word of God is that you reap what you sow. And the Bible makes it clear, this proposition in the Christian life, is that there's a principle in godly living. That we understand through the Bible that yes, we are dead, we have victory in Jesus, we are identified with the death of Christ, we are identified with the resurrection of Christ, and that we have victory in the Lord Jesus, but yet there is this proposition that is given by the Apostle Paul in how we are to live godly lives that please the Lord, because we still have a flesh that desires to lead us to stray. The Bible says that the spirit is willing, but the, the flesh is, is there and, and desiring and active to try to lead us away from God. And so what's the proposition that we find? Well, we noticed some practical truths this morning. A, in your notes, we must realize our position. We must realize our position. In verse 11, the Bible says, Likewise, reckon ye yourselves. The word reckon there means to count as or to take inventory. In other words, the Bible says that you need to be aware of your position in Jesus, that you are dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ the Lord. We must remember that we are dead to sin and to the desires of the flesh, and we are alive to live our life for Jesus Christ, that in Christ we can please the Lord. And I understand that this is not popular preaching in our world today, but it is biblical preaching. Jesus said, if any man is to come after me, first of all, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Our world today is busy on preaching on self-esteem and putting ourselves first. And I understand that there is a, a need to think of ourselves soberly through a biblical perspective. But my friend today, the Bible says if we are going to be a successful Christian, we need to reckon the fact, we need to account to the fact that we are dead in Jesus Christ. And that we are alive to live unto God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, you can write it down, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Jesus Christ our Lord, that I die daily, Paul said. People believe that in the context of 1 Corinthians 15 that Paul is talking about the constant threat that he would be in his life of those trying to kill him for preaching the gospel. But if you carefully look at the context of that passage of Scripture, Paul is saying, I am under the constant threat of being killed. I am under the constant threat of being attacked. But it does not sway me. It doesn't concern me because I am dead to myself and I am living for God. He said, I die daily. My life is not about me. My life is about God. He died to self, and he lived for God, and there he found great, sex, a great success. One of the greatest, greatest missionaries that ever lived in this world, outside of the Lord Jesus, we find the Apostle Paul. So we see letter B there, we must allow God to reign. Verse 12 says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Who is the king of your life today? Who is the king? Who is reigning in your life today? The Bible says that Jesus, King Jesus, wants to reign. But my friend, you cannot have two masters. You will serve one, you will hate the other. You will lean to one and you will forget about or despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Who is the king of your life? You see, the reality is write it down that there are only two choices on the shelf. You'll either love God and despise God. You'll love God or you'll love yourself. And my friend today, the Bible says that we must allow God to reign. Don't let the flesh or sin reign in your mortal bodies. Look what the Bible says. Number one, do not yield to self. In verse 13, it says, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God 
as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God, for sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace. God forbid. My friend, today the Bible says that there's a choice to be made, but in Jesus, if you're born again, then you have victory in Christ. You can overcome the flesh. You can find victory in Jesus, but you must not yield to yourself. You must yield to God. The Bible says that we must yield yourself servants to obey. When you came to Christ as your Savior, you obeyed the gospel. Someone told you that Jesus loves you and that he died for you and you, you came to Christ and you, you bowed your head and you prayed and asked Jesus to be your Savior. And the Bible says in this scripture, verse 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness, we must yield to God and live unto God, the Bible says. But we must choose the Lord. We must obey the Lord, not our flesh or our desires, but we must choose the Lord. And we find, let her see there, that we have victory in Jesus Christ. He wraps all of this up in verse 17 to say, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. We see, first of all, number one, the work of God, verse 17. But God be thanked. Salvation is God's work. God's work. And where you are in your Christian life today, where you are walking with God, is because of God working in you. It's not because of your own merit. It's God be thanked. But God be thanked. And my friend today, if you're strayed from the Lord where you can be, it's God be thanked. This is the work of God. And the Bible makes it clear. This is the work of God, verse 17. But God be thanked. This is the walk of the ungodly in verse 17. The Bible says that ye were the servants of sin. Before you came to Christ, you desired the world. You desired to live for yourself. You desired all of those things. This was the walk of the ungodly. But we see the witness in our salvation. We obeyed the gospel. The Bible says, but ye have obeyed from the heart. Notice that expression, the heart. A heart decision, the form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. You received the gospel truth. And now Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now you're born again. Now the Spirit of God has baptized you into the family of God. He is in your heart. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And you now have newness of life. And so what's the secret, Pastor Burns? All of this message, what's the secret of a successful Christian life? (laughs) It's to keep obeying God. You started in the family of God by obeying the truth of the gospel. And the Bible says that wisdom for success, number four, is keep on obeying God and keep on making Christ king of your life. Not submitting to the flesh, Not leaning toward the desires of the flesh, but let Jesus reign in our heart. And this is where we find true success. Two choices on the shelf, friend. There's pleasing God or there's pleasing yourself. I don't know where you are in the Christian life, but my desire, my desire for you as we come into chapter 6, God's desire for you, is that you would succeed in the Christian life. We are born again. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Oh, pastor, that means I can just live the life that I want to live. No, 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 no. It means now you can live the life that you ought to live because there's victory in Jesus. And when Christ died, I died. When Christ rose from the grave, I rose from the grave. And now I have newness of life, a new purpose to please God. And through Jesus, I can please God. There's the work of God, the walk of the ungodly, the witness in our salvation. And there's just some simple wisdom for success. Keep on obeying God. Let God, let Christ be the king of your life. And my friend today, God will do a wonderful work in your life if you'll just say yes to him. Let's pray together, can we? Father in heaven, thank you for your word. 
And Father, I pray that you would work in our hearts and our lives where there are various Christians in various places in their life. And Father, there's no doubt about it that there may be even a Christian here that is struggling with some area in their life. God is working in their heart. Wherever, that, wherever they are, I pray, Father, that you would direct them and guide them to the truth of the Word of God. Help them, Lord, I pray, to make you the king of their life today. And Father, I pray that you would work in our hearts. We know that in our world, sin is abounding, but grace abounds more. And we thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for the victory that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray you would work in our hearts today. I pray you would bless every good decision. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our hymn books together.